All right. All right. Should be, should be good to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, on things hidden, we usually uh, tackle the the current world events and all of the relevant topics through an anthropological uh, lens. But uh, I've been I've been uh, listening to your uh, on your uh, I've been listening to you your presentations on on your uh, YouTube channel, James, and uh, I saw that you were going through uh, this uh, Vladimir Lossky's uh, mystical theology uh, of the Eastern Church. I don't know if you can see that because of the background, it's getting mixed up. So yeah, yeah I'm. It, it's definitely uh, one of my recommendations, uh, go-to books if you want to uh, get the basics at least of Orthodox theology. But this book, it talks about mystical theology. Is this like uh, an aspect of theology that uh, that is often overlooked when it comes to uh, mainstream Christian discussions? And... Uh, so I want to I want to find a way to tie this in uh, this mystical aspect of Christianity with the anthropological uh, discussions uh, that we're having in on things hidden. So just to give us uh, just to give our audience uh, a brief overview, uh, what is I mean when we think about mysticism, you know when the average person thinks about mysticism, uh, a lot of things come into that, that, that person's mind. Uh, that, that person may be thinking of, you know, your typical Eastern concepts like yoga, for example, that's a kind of mysticism. So, uh, and, uh, you know, chanting and all of that, Buddhist chanting and all of that. So what is this mystical aspect of Christianity? Uh, if, if you can give us a brief summation. Yeah, I think uh, we actually can go to the text. I have it here as well, and I, I agree with you. Um, so right at the beginning, uh, we have a quote here. It says, um, in a certain sense, all theology is mystical inasmuch as it shows forth the divine mystery, the data of revelation. And I love that point right there, the data of revelation. So on the one sense, um, it's the mystical that discloses the divine mystery. It says, on the other hand, mysticism is frequently opposed to theology as a realm of inaccessible to understanding as an uttered unutterable mystery, a hidden depth to be lived rather than known, yielding itself to a specific experience, which surpasses our faculties of understanding rather than to any perception of sense or intelligence. Uh, if we adopted this latter conception unreservedly, resolutely opposing mysticism to theology, we should be led in the last resort to the thesis. And he goes into Bergson here. So I think the, the point that he makes in this book is that the, the idea of uh, mystical theology is is that the idea of mysticism and theology, just like the idea of theory and praxis are wed together from an orthodox perspective as that one presupposes and is 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 uh, interlinked with the other. Uh, right. So uh, and I think it's it's interesting to think through it. Right. Uh, because in, in, and to kind of define our terms when we're talking about orthodox theology and anthropology is like, where are we coming from? Uh, in the first place, you know, we both have a secular background and a study in philosophy and, and uh, psychoanalysis. And it's interesting talking with folks that are, uh, are you Orthodox Christian, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. yes. coming, how long have you been Orthodox uh, Christian? Uh, since 2019. 2019. Okay. Before that, what was your experience uh, in terms of coming at something like a mystical theology? What would be your reference point prior to that time? It would be, uh, I, I wouldn't say I've had any mystical, uh, I, I've, I haven't encountered any mystical aspect in Christianity. I was a Protestant uh, before coming to Orthodoxy. Uh, I would have to go further back into uh, Hinduism. And uh, in Hinduism, I, I don't know. I mean, it's very, uh, I would say it, it has a, it has a taste of, uh, it's something that is beyond rationality that we can't uh, really reason, you know, in our uh, in our logical faculties. So uh, I would say like that is the mysticism that I perceived before uh, reading Lossky's book. 
so it, it's a very it's a very strange thing to uh i would say like in hinduism you had this uh it's it's a very different world view but it's very it's you can relate to it in a sense if, if, when you in when you are in orthodoxy so for example this notion of uh, i mean i know like we can get into this uh, concept later on like this concept of the essence energies distinction this uh, notion that god is present in all of creation it's almost like a pantheistic concept to uh, to to a degree and uh, but the thing is like uh, it's uh, the mysticism in hinduism it's it has a very impersonal uh, uh, aspect to it i wouldn't say that it has uh, it it has a, it provides us with any basis uh, for personality or you know personhood whatever uh, what you'd like to call it so yeah I, I would say that that's sort of my you know distant encounter with mysticism and uh, prior to coming to Christianity yeah no excellent and um, I, I was mm -hmm. really uh, immersed in Taoism uh, prior to oh, you, you know, oh yeah that's very similar to Hinduism in in many ways yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, you know, prior to, you know, I was born uh, an Orthodox Christian and um, I fell away from the church for a good two decades. Um, and I really was interested in the mystical aspects of the Eastern you know, traditions and uh, really got really fascinated with Taoism and specifically, tr you know, traditional Chinese medicine. I used to practice Qigong, uh, which is a type of a type of Taoist yoga. Right. And it's it's an attempt mm -hmm. to tarry with kind of the mystical, but in terms from an Orthodox perspective, or just in general, I like to kind of look at things at, etymologically, right? The root word of mystical is is, uh, is mystery, right? So uh, in Orthodoxy, we call the the sacraments, the mysteries. So participating mm -hmm. in communion and, and marriage and things of that nature. So what I really like about the Orthodox, from the Orthodox theological perspective is the practical, practical aspect of encountering the mystical, and that both of those are wedded together in, in a theory and a praxis, right? And then when we're talking about something like anthropology, right, we're we're looking at something anthropos in Greek, right? Is the, the man is man is human human, right? Logos anthropologia, right, is the logic. But I like to think of the term logos like uh, the revelation. So anthropology is the revelation of man, right? Orthodoxy, orthodox, right? The right uh, doxa, which is worship or, or right glorification. Thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the appropriate glorification theology, theo meaning, uh, you know, God and the logo. So Orthodox theology is the appropriate, um, the appropriate worship, uh, of the revelation of God, right. And anthropology is the, the revelation or the logic of man. And in Orthodox theology, we think of Christ as the theanthropos, right? The theanthropos. So it connects those two very practically and poignantly of the uh, of theanthropos, God, man, the God, man. Yeah. yeah. So that that is the template that we use and we operate under when we talk about something like the mystical theology and the, the practice of this mystical theology. So the intertwined in this kind of more spiritual, ephemeral sense of the mystical and the practical sense of the praxis and the practices, prayer, almsgiving that we do. So it's really intertwined in both the theory and the praxis when we talk about uh, mystical theology. Um, and having one without the other is not is not orthodox, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And uh, uh, Lossky has... Uh, uh, I'm just going to try to, I marked out quite a lot of uh, his passages in this book. It was uh, very enlightening for me in my initial years uh, uh, during my catechesis uh, stages of coming into orthodoxy. And he says that uh, in the introduction uh, chapter, outside the truth kept by the whole church personal uh, sorry, kept by the whole church, personal experience would be deprived of all certainty, of all objectivity. It would be a mingling of truth and of falsehood, of reality and of illusion. 
mysticism in the bad sense of the word. So this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, what I would say was my encounter in Hinduism. Is uh, like there's no certainty. Like so, this moral relativity is very heavy in in Hindu worldview. Uh, that's why uh, it it sort of like uh, impacts the societal condition of uh, Hindu society, uh, particularly India. Uh, so he, he continues, on the other hand, the teaching of the church would have no hold on souls if it did not in some degree express an inner experience of truth granted in different measure to each one of the faithful. There is therefore no Christian mysticism without theology. Again, this is like, uh, like you said, but above all, there is no theology without mysticism. So... I, I'm more interested in, uh, like, for example, like uh, how Hindu mysticism has impacted uh, India and it has sort of like uh, created this moral relat relativism uh, kind of uh, environment in India. So I'm thinking like, uh, I, I guess I would say like, I, I want to know how orthodox theology impacts human society. And this is a very important question uh, in my own uh, perspective is because uh, many people think theology as something that is very abstract, very, uh, you know, disconnected from the real material world. And uh, uh, in the previous episode of Things Hidden, uh, Shane Kennedy, one of uh, my, my good friend, he's, he made this uh, very acute observation uh, which say, he said that the, uh, culture culture is downstream from theology. Uh, is this, uh, so I found that particularly fascinating. So, so I would like you to like uh, uh, if 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 it's okay, I would like us to get into that. So why is orthodox theology? Why is this right thinking? You know, right worship so important for humans uh, because we're, we're living in a society which is not very, you know, will, um, it's it's like a homogenized, you know, global culture, which is not very high on, you know, uh, abiding by the truth, by objective truth. It's very uh, relativistic, uh, the current culture and everything. You have this notion of, you know, your, you have your truth and I have my own truth. So why should humans be concerned about something like theology and particularly the mystical aspect of it? How does this boil down to more, let's say, uh, more material in the material world? Yeah, no, I think I think that's the right question, and I like that idea that uh, culture is downstream of theology because there's the idea that politics is downstream of culture, and having any kind of meaningful, you know, uh, conversation with someone, you you know, it gets down to the theological, whether it's a psychological in nature, it really gets down to the kind of brass task. What is it? Uh, what is it ours to do in this world? What does it mean to be man? What is what is reality? What is orth? Um, you know, what is objective reality? And I think we've found ourselves in our current culture um, really focused on the the Gnostic notion of of kind of gnosis or a focus on the abstract, right? Uh, again, it comes back to me of this idea of the connection and the relatedness of the abstract and the concrete, right? Uh, those are those are completely interrelated. So, and when you talk about something like the truth or my truth and you see this in kind of the new age religions and now kind of in our culture when we talk of something like the um uh we're seeing with the transgender movement and just in general right so this the the idea that um that my essence my authenticity my truth is not related or relational to the society or culture that i'm in right and it's kind of this hidden inner essence that only i have access to and I need to express it through going through X, Y, and Z. Uh, but I think from an Orthodox perspective, the kind of the inverse is true where, you know, identity, your identity as, as a person is not defined, is not self-defined. You can't self-name yourself. 
Your identity exists within a network of relationships and your identity emerges based on the quality, the nature and the depth of those relationships. So it's, 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 it's really the inverse of the trajectory that we're on that, you know, uh, that there is just my unique truth, which is also uh, true as well, but we need to get back to this idea. And, and from my, you know, from my philosophical background and, and for, you know, a good amount of my time, I, I was really into the notion of, um, you know, that, that truth is relative, right. Uh, and, and the effect that that's had on society is kind of, is, is profound in a negative sense. So coming back to this notion in the last five years that, that there is something like the truth out there, right? And it is, is a profound departure from kind of my way of thinking before, but the effect that that's had on my life is, is you can use and, and by the praxis and the practices that you do going to church and praying and whatnot, there's a certain discernment that emerges from that. And that discernment changes the nature and the quality of the relationship, the relationships that you have with people and the decisions that you make uh, in the world that we find ourselves in. And you could really practically look at that when we look at something like the, uh, the, the last few years with, with COVID and the decisions that I made with my family about whether to take a certain medication, the nature of the lockdowns, whether to keep children out of school, right? All of these kind of difficult decisions that we had to make in the headwinds of this cultural phenomenon, this cultural pattern of authoritarianism that kind of took, you know, took over the world. Now we can reflect back and look and see was the, is the algorithm working appropriately? Is the relationship between the abstract and the concrete between the mystical and the practical? If you look back, you can see where the decisions made healthy for you and your family, right? And it's a way of, of kind of discerning uh, of what the truth is, right? The truth is, is there regardless of, of our personal truth of our unique truth, but what is the relationship between the truth and my truth? I think that's the question that we need to start focusing on. Um, but we are at a point from a cultural and societal perspective where we don't believe in the truth that that isn't, that's called fascism now, right? Uh, which is a very interesting phenomenon that that has developed that any type of uh, understanding of the truth or the Christian truth is automatically categorized as fascist, right? So it's it's an interesting kind of place we, we find ourselves in. And I think it comes back to this Gnostic thread, this neo-Gnostic thread that we find ourselves in that's moving towards transhumanism of this idea of that there's this secret knowledge that only a few people have and obtaining that secret knowledge you know, you keep it to yourself and that forms your identity and you express it by self-naming your identity. Uh, but that, and, and from my experience and from where I stand is, is a devastating notion from a cultural perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, it's very fascinating that you mentioned this, uh, this neo-Gnostic uh, worldview that has, uh, that has totally, you know, overtaken us and it totally you know the 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 ruling elites uh uh influencers they're they're all uh peddling this kind of worldview to us so a lot of people would say that uh and i've certainly uh talked to some uh non-christian friends who who say this is that this this mentality this uh, neo-gnostic uh, mentality that has uh, engulfed uh, the entire world uh, generally uh, because you know the uh, the non-western cultures are also influenced by uh, western culture because of this you know the emergence of the internet and uh, the printing press and all of these you know unifying mediums so uh, a lot of my friends and a lot of these uh, non-christians you know this Neo pagan uh movement that we are seeing the, today would say that this is downstream from uh Christianity. This is uh this is uh from Christian uh impact. You know, like uh, this is it, all of this is like a slow uh, logical conclusion of uh, the effect that's presented by uh, and certainly you know Nietzsche I think was one of those people who. Uh, uh, adhere to this kind of uh, point of view. So, what would you say to that kind of uh, you know 
thinking like is it christianity's fault that we are here in this place because christianity for example gave a rise to the notion of you know universalism and by universalism i mean like it's like a brotherhood of man you know regardless of religion regardless of race gender you know ethnicity and whatnot uh, so, uh, uh, and we are seeing right now this thing called globalism, which is, uh, you know, like the erasing of ba boundaries, the erasing of borders. And, you know, like you, uh, uh, West, many Western nations, they freely admit all kinds of immigrants. I know that's because they no longer have a concrete view of borders. So what would you say to that kind of, uh, of you know, that kind of that point of view well I, th I think it's it's interesting we're in a unique period in in history and in time right now um as you, we see the kind of complete destruction of the atheist movement remember the new atheist movement with the four horsemen of the apocalypse that dan dennett uh sam uh harris christopher hitchens and um um who's the fourth one, Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins came back and, and just recently in the last few weeks has made some comments on the actual necessity of religious belief in a culture. And we, and what's been emerged and what's become relevant and, and apparent to me and to a lot of people is that there's no such thing as getting rid of religion. Um, religion is that which binds us. And that happens sort of at an unconscious level. And with the, the, uh, the effacement and the destruction of the new atheist movement, uh, we see it kind of morph into the woke movement. And we see these woke proclamations and these ideas about society uh, being put forth in a very religious sense. And we're actually seeing a reemergence of, uh, of paganism in this kind of neo-pagan structure that's emerging. And if you look at it from a Christian perspective, it was it's quite written in the gospel that this would happen at a certain time in history. So that's both comforting and terrifying, as we're seeing the the erasure or the the dismantling of the of the Christian uh, ethos, which is the kind of basis of Western civilization, and like you said, uh, and and has been universalized. That is uh, kind of subtract uh, uh, being subtracted, and something else is emerging that is religious. We're not going to some kind of rational utopianism, right? We're moving into hyper religious unconscious um uh culture that's that's emerging and if we if we look at the term culture right the root word of the term culture is cult and there's this idea I, there's no uh, there's humans worship humans uh develop and emerge into cults right and those cult there's no getting away from that so there's no getting away from uh being binded by an idea and, and through time and through people. So once we get to that notion, and I think once you talk with even with secular folks and, and you really point out, maybe don't use those exact terms, you can see that there's a rel religious aspect to uh, this kind of woke movement that we're seeing emerging here, right? So uh, even ideas like worship, which, um, you know, is anathema to someone that's, that's, that's you know, rationalist, uh, you know, um, atheist, humans cannot but worship. We have an option of what to worship, and either we're going to do it consciously, where we worship, uh, you know, Christianity, or it's going to sublimate, and we're going to be worshiping things like uh, money, uh, power, uh, status, um, you know, and things of that nature. You know, so there's no getting around the religious aspect of it, and I think once, as we see this understanding emerge, we're going to see. Um, more folks come towards something like Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox religion, which we're seeing happening in, in a very interesting way. Uh, you know, in America, uh, you know, Orthodox people, folks that go to the Orthodox church that are Orthodox Christians is less than one, 2%, uh, I think maybe 3%. So how can we understand that the Orthodox uh, Christianity has access to the truth and uh, does that mean that humanity, that Americans need to become Orthodox practicing Orthodox Christians in order to embody and access this truth or or what? Right. So uh, it's an interesting place we find ourselves in. And I find that my Orthodox practice in my my um, my Orthodox Christianity, it, it 
it, it, it merges in the relationships that I have with people and not in an overt way where I proselytize about Orthodox theology, what I just read. It happens in the nature and get in quality of the relationships that um, that I encounter now, which have a different feel and different quality to them. So it's 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 an interesting uh, way that uh, that both the anti-Christian, neo-pagan religions are coming forth, but also this more ancient understanding, originary or understanding of Christianity is emerging as well. And we're seeing these two kind of uh, cultural patterns emerge. Um, and, uh, you know, as you know, in the gospel, when that happens, uh, I, I hesitate to think that we're living in the end times, uh, but we're always living in the end times of something, of our lifetime, of some sort of, you know, worldview. Um, I think we are in some some sort of uh, you know, uh, some sort of historical moment where that is emerging. Um, and the, the question of how to engage with that um, is is an interesting one. But I find more people, normies, quote unquote normies, very comfortable in having conversations about angels and demons and the spiritual realm. Uh, whereas even five, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have that conversation except with a few people that are interested in that type of stuff. Now it's it's quite uh, it's quite prevalent, uh, which presents I think it's you know opportunities and, and challenges when we talk about uh you know the the, the orthodox uh, you know embodying orthodoxy. Yeah, I mean like uh, this, uh, people ha are discovering orthodoxy. I think more uh, in this uh, in this time than than let's say our parents' generations or our grandfathers' generations. Uh, so uh, I think people are realizing that there was this notion of, you know, like I'm spiritual, but not religious, uh, that kind of, you know, new age kind of thinking that was prevalent uh, during the during the 60s, 70s, all through the 90s. Uh, but right now, I think people are realizing it's like Girard said uh, that uh, humanity is a child of religion. And uh, I, I think like people are realizing the truth of that, and uh, like you said, they are they are really anxious, uh, really eager to bind themselves, uh, towards uh, something uh, that is ancient, and like this this can go either ways, like you said, right? It goes to it can go towards something like paganism, or it can go something towards a more authentic a more orthodox uh, form of Christianity. So uh, this is very interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense what you said. Well, even uh, from, a, for, I, from an orthodox perspective, let's double click a little bit on this, right? So traditional Christianity, Western Christianity um, it has this notion that, the, that there's no such thing as the pagan gods or the Greek gods of Olympus, right? From an Orthodox perspective, that's not the case. And that surprises a lot of people, right? Because uh, we are, we believe in the pagan gods. We don't worship them, but they're there in an appropriate Orthodox ethos and an, an appropriate Orthodox Christianity actually has a place for the pagan gods. If the hierarchy is appropriately set, Right. If Christ is at the apex, then that allows the, um, you know, this the location, the, the gods that really reflect a particular location to be appropriately situated. That's why we see orthodoxy in, in Europe come through uh, cities and countries. Uh, it incorporates the pagan structures into uh, into the higher order, in a sense. Right. So the appropriate uh, comportment from a Christian perspective makes room for all of the lower deities, even the Hindu deities, right? The uh, important distinction is the the orthodoxy, the appropriate right worship, right? Is 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 what's important, and I think um, I, th I wonder what you're what you think about this question. For in order for a society uh, or culture to reorient itself, do you think that is going to necessitate? that people overtly become Orthodox Christian. I mean, we're both Orthodox Christians. Is that what has to happen? If not, what, well, what, what has to happen? Well, I mean, as per uh, church doctrine, uh, perhaps that is a necessity uh, more so than we're willing to uh, concede. But the thing is like, it's, it's a very difficult uh, scenario to, I mean, if we're thinking pragmatically, it's very difficult, for example, like uh, in, in a culture like 
like where I'm from, I don't see how that is possible. But of course, you know, uh, I, it's, it's a very, uh, it's very difficult to express. So for example, like God has created orthodoxy and surely he has created it uh, so that a lot of people can be saved. A lot of people can be, uh, uh, you know, as per orthodox thinking, un united to uh, Christ, uh, theosis, right? So, uh, but at the same time, we have we've had this trajectory. We, this this has uh, placed a hindrance uh, uh, for a lot of these people. Uh, this this trajectory in includes like uh, uh, this uh, the deeds by uh, missionaries. You know, like India has cer certainly had. Uh, ninety nine percent Protestant missionaries, or uh, significantly, uh, some, uh, Catholic missionaries as well, but at the same time, you know, there's no uh, like there's zero or uh, next to zero interaction with with the Orthodox world in terms of religion. So uh, I'm thinking like, okay, so if God has placed, uh, if God has, uh, you know created this religion he if god has carefully formed this religion this uh, arc you know that's uh, that's often like the iconographical uh, representation of our orthodoxy if god has created such a thing why would he place all of these hindrances uh, beforehand perhaps this is a, a, theo a question more in line with theodicy i don't know but uh, i, I Maybe, maybe there is a more realistic approach of you know influencing the culture, and uh, what I mean by that is uh, I've had this discussion with David uh, Gornowski as well, and he has also asked me this question like, uh, do you think uh, the future of you know a, a nation like America, do you think the future of that country is orthodoxy? And my uh, personal opinion was that uh, it's more in line with uh, the existential thinker uh, Barjayev, who said that orthodoxy throughout the centuries were, was hidden. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know why it was hidden. Maybe it has more to do with the uh, caliphate, uh, the geographical situations of countries like Greece and Russia. But it was really hidden from the from the larger uh, portion of the world, and because of that, uh, Christianity uh, did not uh, have that fully full effect of uh, on the world as it would uh, if it was uh, synthesized with orthodox thinking. So uh, I I think uh, another another way of looking at it is. Uh, something that is very uh, big in, and this is coming back to theology to a certain degree, is that uh, Protestantism and Catholicism have this uh, has this uh, a theory called the penal substitution, uh, uh, penal atonement theory. This is absent from orthodoxy, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, orthodoxy has something that is more of a, a Christ conquered death on the cross he he defeated death he did not uh you know satisfy uh, a, a wrathful father as the penal atonement theory uh, uh claims so i think this aspect of orthodoxy this uh defeating on the de uh, of death on the cross it bears uh, a much more uh non uh you know non coercive non violent uh, effect on society what i mean by it, by that is uh if we have that kind of framework of the trinity where where the trinity is not divided against each other is not in uh, you know rivalry in a sense uh, against each other if we have that trinity of mutual love mutual glorification and all of that and we apply it to I'll put, uh, say something like a political domain, then that would be bearing out much uh, better fruit than what we are seeing today. So I, I'm I'm adhering to that kind of you know uh, effect of orthodoxy on the world. 
uh this is like uh, i'm trying to reconcile my my realistic you know uh outlook with my uh love for the orthodox church yeah i i think it's interesting uh you know there's a lot there i think it's it's interesting that um to bring it back to the the kind of the topic of this discussion of the the mystical theology right mystery mysteria is hidden right and this hidden uh nature of the most ancient church in terms of orthodoxy which has made its way through thousands of years of heresy and dark ages and you know if you think about it it's quite profound if you really look at the history of of kind of orthodoxy and how and to see now that it's emerging and just in the last 100 150 years all of the writings of the church fathers are now being translated into english i don't think nietzsche had access to these writings in a sense so and uh from my personal perspective i was really interested in taoism and, and eastern spirituality and then when i found the church fathers which i was reluctant to look to I, it just became clear to me. It's like, oh, everything I've been looking for in meditation and Zen Buddhism and Taoism is there in its purest form from the church fathers. And they've been talking about this for for the last thousand uh, plus years. And to see that kind of reemerging now is 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 a, a wonderful thing to contemplate. Um, and um, I'm actually able to, the blessing of God, thank God to go and visit Greece uh, next month, actually in August. And I'm actually going to visit Mount Athos with my son, my nine-year-old son, which is kind of came out of nowhere and, it, and it's a blessing. And I think the story of St. Ephraim or Elder Ephraim uh, is, is uh, instructive here, right? So Ephraim was a, a elder who was at, at Mount Athos praying on the mountain. Uh, and he came down one day and he came down and spoke to his novices and to the, 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 the monks on Mount Athos. And he said, I'm going to build 19 monasteries in North America. And the novices and the monks were like, what are you, what are you talking about? Wait, they're not Orthodox at all. Right. I mean, there's no Orthodoxy in America. He says, America with what's coming now is going to need it. Uh, and he actually did it. He had the blessing of a spiritual father and he came to the uh, to North America, and he built his main monastery. Uh, I was able to visit at St. Anthony's Monastery in Arizona, and he built 19 other monasteries in, in North America, and there's one close to me here, about two hours uh, from my home. So uh, I think it's it's interesting that he had the discernment and the inclination and the impetus. Where did this come from? To do something on the face of it so absurd, to spend all this time, energy, and resources to build monasteries in North America when there's no orthodoxy really there to take hold but the idea is there that's like we were saying how the west exports its culture to the rest of the world that you know that's where the battle is going to happen and that's where we need the stronghold of orthodoxy to take root um, and i find it absolutely profound and beautiful that now uh, this ancient religion is re-emerging um, as we see the disintegration of uh, christianity from a protestant and kind of a western perspective it, you know uh, disintegrate uh, so I, th I think it's a, it's a beautiful and a, and a profound thing. And I like it to this idea of, of what is the relationship between secular culture and, and Orthodox theology? I like this idea that, that, you know, we have something like Mount Athos where you've had monks for a thousand years, continuously, pretty much praying for the world. The monks don't just pray for Orthodox Christians. They are in continuous prayer contemplation um, and praying for the world, right? So I look at it as like our cultural DNA, our cu cultural pluripotent cells that you find in your bones, which is the you know the essence of of what makes your body and constructs your body. As the structures disintegrate, there's still that DNA. There's still that uh, that cultural DNA that is is being held together by the prayer of the monks in Mount Athos and of these other monasteries, right? That's where we're going to re-energize our culture. It's going to come from, you know, uh, from these monks praying on a mountain. That is what I believe. What that's going to look like practically, I have no idea. But I find myself caught up in this current of participating in whatever it is that's emerging now um, within within our culture. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, you're from India, correct? Yes. And uh, are your folks uh, orthodoxy? 
Orthodox Christians? Uh, my mom is an Orthodox, and uh, but the rest of my family members are uh, Hindus. And what do they make of your interest in your conversion to Orthodoxy? Well, it's uh, very fascinating you ask that. For example, uh, uh, I have this icon corner uh, in my home, and uh, in that icon corner are various things such as uh, prayer rope and holy water. So uh, uh, you may be familiar that there is uh, something similar to the prayer rope in Eastern religions as well. So when they see things like these, uh, the holy water and the, the icons and prayer rope, they are instantly uh, connecting it to their own religious uh, artifacts. So they're thinking like this is the same. It's just like uh, in an entire different package. But uh, this is like, again, like, uh, and I try to explain this to them as well. Like you mentioned, this is like preservation of uh, these things in its full, in its uh, purest form, right? So, uh, for example, uh, this <clears throat> almost pantheistic uh, notion that's in, uh, maybe it's not almost, maybe it is, I'm not uh, sure about that. But this thing like God is present in the material. So when Hindus, for example, have these idols or images of their deities, uh, they, they are not really distinguishing the creator from the created, right? It is like this uh, boundary is not there. Uh, but in orthodoxy, uh, this boundary is there. It's like the boundary between person, uh, personhood and nature. And uh, like this is distinctions, right? It's not necessarily divisions, so, so on. So this is a very, uh, very uh, difficult concept for uh, both Westerns, uh, Westerners and Easterners to understand is that uh, because it's like uh, largely the world operates in a very dialectical fashion, right? So this antimony uh, is not present in orthodoxy this like uh, you know like a, a constant tension or maybe it's uh, there in a very different way so for example an another example that i might give is that uh, uh, the, the the thing about relics for let's say so relics are, are a very peculiar thing to uh, Protestants uh, uh, and Catholic, uh, sorry, Catholics have that too. But Protestants, they might think that this is a form of idolatry. So uh, this is like the other extreme end, right? So in Hinduism and other Eastern religions, uh, they 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 don't have any problem with idolizing the material, right? But the but the, but the uh, secular. Uh, secularized kind of Christian wing, the Protestant style, they they are very, you know, careful of, you know, uh, approaching that in a sense that, you know, they, they might idolize, they might end up, you know, committing idolatry. So this is another thing. And that's why I'm so interested in this because uh, it's, it's such a complicated, it's such a sophisticated uh, worldview uh, the Orthodox Church has. And how that might, you know, impact the world, how it might provide a solution to what uh, the world, uh, the problems, uh, you know, the groaning of creation that's going on in our time. So, yeah, I, I think I, mean, you, I, I think you hit it uh, on the head there. And I think that going back to the earlier part of our conversation, that there's no you don't have an option of uh, whether to fall prey to idol worship or ideology worship, right? I think they're very, they're akin to each other, right? So if you're not um, consciously appropriately comporting yourself, worshiping appropriately, that doesn't mean you're not worshiping, right? If you're consciously, uh, you know, hesitant to um, idolize X, Y, and Z, and you don't have a, a structure to point you in the right direction, you will idolize something. It is, it is in the very inherent nature and structure of being human. And building culture is is and and I think that's uh that's instructive in the in the idea of the the Ten Commandments right when we think of of uh, you know you shall have no god 
uh, other than me, and you shall not create idols, the first two commandments, right? What What is God talking about here? He's saying that if if you don't uh, in, worship the infinite, uh, uh, if you don't worship the Trinity, if you don't worship God the Father uh, through his son, Jesus Christ, then yeah, you will worship something else. And in doing so, you're going to invest your, uh, your being, your human being into something else. There's no not worshiping. Right. So I think that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. That's, uh, that's, yeah, we can't escape. We can't escape worship is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think that's an interesting tension that you're articulating where the hesitancy of, uh, Protestants, uh, in terms of looking at icons as, as idol worship, but from an internally, from an Orthodox perspective, you know, we're not worshiping the saints, right? we are participating with the saints and worshiping Christ, right? Just like you pray for, you ask people to pray for you. You're not worshiping the people you're asking to pray for you. You're participating with the people you're asking to pray, right? We do the same thing in orthodoxy with the saints that have passed, right? We are asking them for, uh, for their intercessions in prayer to uh, Christ. Uh, and I think understanding yeah. that, it's an, it's an important way to kind of uh, kind of grasp um, the importance of it. And, and again, I think, um, you know, seeing uh, these new cultural patterns and these new pa neo-pagan patterns, they're emerging, uh, people are more open to uh, looking and trying to make sense of what's going on. And I think that's why people are moving towards something like orthodoxy across the, across the globe. Um, and I think in another sense, the very fundamental question of culture and society and civilization is the question of the relationship between the individual and the collective, right? It's the history of the 20th century, uh, you know, and, and obviously from before that. And I think rooted in that, the question of the, the right relationship between the individual and the collective comes the question between the right relationship between freedom, freedom and obedience and the right relationship between power and authority. And the or the orthodox mystical tradition gives gives us an answer to that idea of what is the right relationship between freedom, obedience, power, and authority, and what is the right relationship between the individual and the collective. Um, and I think someone that's secular or into political uh, political science or whatnot, I think they'll be attracted to that idea and at least look like, what do you mean? That's the question from a political perspective. Um, and I have this this little book here. Uh, that's written by a priest, uh, Mikkel Hill. It's entitled Freedom and Obedience uh, in the Vision of Saint Sophrony. So it's taken the words and the ideas and, and, the, uh, and the discernment of Saint Sophrony, and it's making it very practical to our time. So I have a quote here. If we could uh, look at it real quick. He says, um, <clears throat> he says, we are presented with this antinomy, uh, authentic personhood, which of course is a, a hot button topic right now when we're talking about my truth, my existence. He says, authentic personhood consists of complete obedience to the other, while at the same time allowing complete freedom. So authentic personhood is complete obedience to the other, to the neighbor, to the other, right? While at the same time allowing complete freedom. This is made possible by the uh, the mutual love, and here's the, the linchpin, of those holding authority and those granting it. Ultimately, a love that is divine life, that is divine life, right? Without reciprocal love, this is the key notion uh, from St. Sophrony, right? This canonic love, this self-emptying love, right? Without this reciprocal love between the one in authority and the one in obedience, there could be neither genuine obedience nor authentic freedom, political or otherwise, right? So the very, the very nature of the political and cultural relationships we have between each other and between us and our institutions is found in this right relationship uh, between the individual collective. And it's rooted in this self-emptying, canonic love where those that are in authority are participating in a reciprocal love with those that are granting the authority, right? So I find that a profound and secularly interesting idea to ponder. Right, because we're seeing that the, the institutions across the board, global or you know national institutions, uh, it's a way to test. Do you feel that those that are in power are, uh, are 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 participating in this reciprocal love with those that are under the power of authority? Uh, it's 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 the farthest I think we've been from that 
and we're moving farther yeah. away from that. So what do you make of this, this idea and how can we kind of translate it into, um, you know, practical terms of this right relationship filtered through this self-emptying canonic love? Uh, and I think this goes to the central question of this discussion of the mystical theology and its practical implications. It's rooted in this idea of this canonic self-emptying reciprocal love between individual collective power and authority. Well, I think Losky uh, writes it very well uh, in this book. He is writing that uh, this is the root principle of asceticism. And this is like you mentioned, uh, Mount Athos, uh, a free renunciation of one's own will, of the mere simulacrum of individual liberty in order to recover the true liberty, that of the person which is the image of God in each one. For this reason, Evagrius says that the perfect monk, quote, will after God count all men as God himself. So this is like uh, the key, uh, uh, you know, aspect of Christian societal uh, function is that, uh, as you mentioned, it's like, true liberty and we have this notion of liberty and uh, that is uh, more popular is that uh, you know I have I, I I have the choice to do whatever I want and on a more libertarian uh, uh, you know uh, concept would be as long as you don't hurt anyone right like mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want and uh, you can do uh, you can pretty much, uh, you know, engage in whatever uh, that is uh, pleasurable to you, like that, uh, that helps you in your pursuit, uh, quote unquote, pursuit of happiness or whatever. So uh, uh, the notion uh, that is the, the aspect that is missing from such a such a concept is uh, the, the, this thing called responsibility. And uh, uh, Dostoevsky said it very well, like, uh, you know, in 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 his book, uh, Brothers Karamazov, uh, the main character says that I hold myself responsible for all men's sins. So this is like a very deep, uh, you know, dive into what is authentic liberty, uh, which is uh, which to you know your normal everyday person, uh, you know the the quote unquote normies would find uh, very you know extreme. You know, because they they are used to uh, this uh, thing that is, you know, this overemphasis on, on self-preservation, which can also end up, you know, in, in a kind of self-harm, if you will. It's, it tips the balance, you know, keeps tipping the balance on and off, you know, all the time. But I think here, in, like in, uh, according to Losky, who... Uh, if we really find the very, you know, uh, a good balance between the two, uh, which is, you know, what what many Eastern religions are uh, trying to achieve, right? It's like this balance, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the Tai Chi, you know, this uh, the harmonizing with the flow of nature. And uh, so this like, this is the, the aim of the Eastern religions. And it really speaks to what humanity has been longing for uh, throughout the ages. It's almost like humanity knows that this is the thing that's missing. Like we're, we're always uh, going to one extreme or the other. And, uh, you know, like Christ, uh, you know, provides the perfect, you know, uh, balancing scale in the form of the crucifixion, uh, the, the sacrifice on the cross where he presents this notion as uh, presents this uh, truth of you know self sacrifice for your neighbor loving your neighbor and when you love your neighbor and it's a, it has to again it has to go both ways like you mentioned reciprocal right uh, if you are if you are doing that if you if you are uh, loving your neighbor and your neighbor is in turn loving you then you really don't have uh, these problems that uh, we have today. This problem of you know uh, your truth or my truth and all of that. Our both our truths will be uh, reconciled uh, to say uh, 
you know, in the certain extent, in a certain sense. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And I think um, that's, that's exactly it is this, this self sacrificial love. Uh, I think this is a fractal concept that is obviously embodied perfectly in the crucifixion, but it's relevant to something like how should a, a CEO comport him or herself and function with those under him or her, right? How should a father that is uh, the head of the household, how should he comport himself with his family, right? How should you comport yourself with your neighbor and with your community and so forth and so on? It's rooted in this self-sacrificial uh, kinotic love that is that is necessary for uh, the function of, of society in this way. And I think the yearning for something like communism or socialism is a is a bastardization of this idea, right? To each according from each according to their means to each according to their needs. Is this idea absent the the crucifixion? Uh, and I think that's a profound, profound thing. And I think people intuit the necessity of of of, of sacrificing for the collective, but it's self sacrificing for the collective, not sacrificing others for the collective. I think that's the an important distinction uh, that's there. And I think, and, and the big difference for me from studying the Eastern uh, traditions is the idea of, of, uh, of moksha, the idea of enlightenment, which is the merging with the absolute from an, from an Orthodox Christian perspective. Um, and, and theosis in participating in the universal um, the particular is preserved. You're not, you know, it, it's, you don't become one blob or one, uh, one source with one, uh, become one with source energy and lose your identity. The identity, the particularity is preserved uh, in theosis. And I think that's, that's a huge distinction that we don't see that I haven't really found in any of the Eastern uh, traditions or even any of the Western kind of understandings of Christianity. And I think uh, those go hand in hand from a very practical sense when talking about uh, structuring society and things like, you know, freedom and obedience, power and authority. Yes, it's, that's very, uh, that's very important. Uh, this, uh, like, when people think of, you know, uh, the most common way they perceive of, you know, loving their neighbor is often you know loving the neighbor because that neighbor is part of a collective you know part of the tribe and so on uh but here like uh Losky writes that the person of another will uh, a person of another will appear as the image of god to him who can detach himself from his individual limitations in order to rediscover the nature common to all and to realize by so doing his own doing his own person so this is uh like god is bringing uh that self-sacrificial aspect that that uh loving aspect down to the very core of our being uh like what makes uh you james you know and what makes me so it is like he is uh uh created all of us uniquely uh in in a very unique way like uh we have this distinction in orthodoxy between personhood and nature and uh, personhood is like that is what what is unique to your person and uh, nature is you can say it's like a collective or you know mankind or whatever so this dis distinction like you mentioned is not it's not there in the eastern religions and maybe that that lack of distinction is coming back into western discourse as well uh, and that is why people are more than eager to, you know, set up boundaries uh, of differentiation, you know, like um, detaching themselves from the other person, whether it be in terms of race, ethnicity, you know, nationality or uh, religion and even sects within religion. So they're, they're like very eager to hold on to that, uh, to, you know, bring back that that thing that that boundary you know uh, boundary aspect of humanity back into their uh public uh discourse you know and personal lives 
you know, and uh, they they are rebelling against that which they see as you know this this very Hindu, very Eastern, you know, concept of you know this this new religion that Father Seraphim Rose uh, spoke about. Uh, this globalization, globalizing universal false, you know, twisted perversion of Christianity uh, that that seeks to erase all of us, even even our. And I think this is uh, this this current, uh, you know, transhuman transgender uh, movement is, is a part of this this mission to erase us of our, you know, ultimately our personhood, which will. Uh, make us you know into this very dystopian uh you know unit kind of existence where you're like uh only uh valuable uh like you are a person in as uh you know in as much as you are only valuable to to the to the greater uh good or whatever it is that the that the influencers and the elites think of at at the you know at, at the respective ages so where 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 do you think this is i mean like is there a chance that right thinking will emerge triumphant so this is a very question uh this is a question that's been really bothering me uh and now uh, you have mentioned the the ascetics uh on mount athos do you think uh, that, you know, fortifying ourselves and, you know, just praying for the world, you know, which, which many people see as kind of like a retreating from the world, do you think that will, will, will be successful in, in the transformation of the world? Or is it something like, you know, a rescue mission, which, uh, you know, like, okay, the world is going to totally and it's going to end in destruction it's going to end in violence all are all against all war and we are here to you know as as a kind of floating raft as a kind of uh, you know res rescue boat to you know gather those who are drowning uh, those who are those who are drowning and those who are willing to be saved from this uh, environment what do you think of that uh uh but the the notion of you know asceticism in in the es eschaton you know in the end times yeah i think uh i think the the i don't know but the my intuition is yes i think in the right term i think you're looking for is is an ark right an ark is a is a um a vessel that houses the truth during a time of transformation and destruction right the the mother of God is an ark, right? The ark of a covenant is an ark, uh, right? The burning bush essentially was an ark. It's it's the maybe material instantiation of the preservation of the truth, right? And I think we're seeing an ark developing through, uh, you know, uh, through this, through the internet, right? Through this uh, uh, interconnected uh, web of relationships that are, are being built and, and developed. And I think that we... Um, we are going to see and we are starting to see uh this ramp up of of war from all against all even gerard late in his work uh talked about how we're going to see an increase in these in this uh in in the development of of uh of kind of mimetic rivalries uh until ultimately uh there's a uh a kind of a culminating event uh you know and i think that's that's what we're seeing uh, at least that's what it appears to be, and I think there's uh, a, there's going to be a role for there's a the monks on, in the monasteries they have a role to play, uh, right? But that's not the only role that needs to be played as we transition into the new uh, or or into the, the 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 next world that we are we're clearly in a liminal space between an old world and a new world, and I think that what we're seeing with the, the transgender situation is ultimately going to culminate in the transhumanist transhumanism. And, um, and that's going to necessitate the, the extinguishing of human freedom in order to, uh, to make 
to homogenize and to uh, allow the system to function appropriately, there cannot be this idea of, of human free will. Uh, that has to necessarily be extinguished for the system, the machine, to operate appropriately. That's why we see, you know, vac you know uh, the 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 passports that we're seeing, uh, it just all of these measures that we've seen in the last few years, we're seeing a ramp up. So, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's it's difficult to to think about uh, and to and to, uh, you know kind of contemplate, uh, but we are moving towards something like this culminating event um, over time, and I think it's going to be important. Uh, the truth will not be extinguished. The truth cannot be extinguished. Um, you know, so it, it needs to be uh, discerned, participated in, shared, and and um, and that will get that that gives me hope uh, that will get through this. And it's 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 ultimately, you know, we are um, in the the birth pangs. Like you know, if civilization is is our mother, right? Her water has broke, right? What are we going to do? Are we going to uh, shy away from this? Uh, this revelation from this understanding, or are we going to go uh, find a midwife and help bring forth, uh, you know, the, the new that is coming. Uh, but the new is, is not the novel. The new is not uh, absent. It's, it's an actually rearticulation of, of the old, right. And, and we can look at, you know, from our tradition and, and our perspective uh, you know, what's happening and what's going to happen has been written uh, and at the like we said before, it's at the same time extremely comforting and extremely frightening, um, and that's why it's important to have trust in God and it, have faith. Uh, and I think that's becoming more clear to many people. Yeah, I think that the fact that uh, the resurrection follows the crucifixion uh, means that there is a happy ending to the story of humanity and this is uh yeah i i think i i think that we do not have to look at uh things as uh in a very dreary way as we often tend to you know look look at things we do not have to look at uh the current circumstances the current uh you know events uh, whether on the global scale or on the local level as something that is uh, very uh, you know bleak you know that's heading towards somewhere that's very dark or uh, something like that because one of the one of the great things about Christianity in general is that he, the story has a happy ending uh, there's no endless cycle uh, as you know, re reincarnation or you know the continuously you know, uh, circling of all the ages, you know, like destruction and then you know rebuilding from from the chaos. I don't think like Christianity gives such a revelation. Uh, so when Jesus, when he, when he was crucified and when he was resurrected. He was showing humanity how how the human story is going to play out, and it's going to I think play out in in a way that is uh, that will result in a very joyful, uh, very uh, wonderful ex uh, existence, right? Like the merging of heaven and earth, and the kingdom of God finally establishing uh, on earth. So yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, we can talk about this uh, a lot. A lot, I guess. This is a topic that's that's endless. You know, we can spend a lifetime discussing these things. But yeah, yeah it's. I, I. I really, I really enjoyed your insight, uh, James. And uh, I would encourage uh, all of our listeners uh, of Things Hidden and a Neighbor's Choice to go and subscribe to James's channel on YouTube uh, as a James Cortides. And yeah, uh, any final thoughts, James? Uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion as well. Yeah, very much. I think this is an excellent uh, place to end uh, with, with the hope of the resurrection. Um, and I thank you for your time. It was wonderful to, to talk with you. I hope we get to do it again. 
Um, and I love the, the, you know, David Gordowski and the work that you guys are doing over at things hidden. Um, you know, I think these are, you know, important. Um, and I would, uh, you know, I have talked many times for my subscriber base to, to please go and subscribe with, uh, with friends of David Gronowski on, um, on YouTube, um, and, uh, things hidden podcasts is, is very important. So thank you. Thank you for your time and your energy. And, um, and until next time. Well, yes. Take care. All right. God, God bless. bless. Bye.